Our co-host, the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield, two-star. <laughs> Good morning again, Rob. And Maria Lawrence, an all-star. Good morning. Uh, Good to have you Many both with stars. us. Many stars. Many stars. Many stars. Our guest in this program from Americans for Prosperity, West Virginia chapter is Jason Huffman, who has the best picture of anybody who supplies pictures to us to uh, be a guest on the program. Jason, good morning to you. Hey, Rob. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. We're flashing your James Bond uh, secret agent photo up there on the screen right now. There he Can't is. Go wrong it's the with classic. The blue tuxedo. That's the wedding Can't tux, right? It is. That's it the is. Yeah. How many Still years fit, have been? How, how many years have been married fit. now? Since 2018. 2018, six years, and the tuck still fits, you just said. It still fits, and uh, the wife hasn't left yet, so that's always a good sign. <laughs> well, I like to think that this show has provided some good luck to you in your marriage. It has. Well, you're certainly complimentary. I make sure that she knows that. <laughs> well, very nice. You folks have released your Pathway to Prosperity agenda for 2025, so let's talk about that. What are you going to do? <laughs> Well, Rob, I, I think some context is important. Uh, West Virginia has not had a day one Republican governor with a Republican supermajority in the legislature since before the Prohibition era. So with the election of Patrick Morrissey as governor in November, which is extremely likely given the political landscape in the state, we're really positioned to have a historic uh, transformation in terms of the reforms that are passed. So that's the context in which we're releasing our uh, Pathway to Prosperity legislative agenda, which folks can take a look at, by the way, by visiting wvpathway.com. Um, our goal with this is really simple. Uh, we want to lay the groundwork for, for the big-time reforms to come. Um, we're, we're really leveraging our sort of signature grassroots approach by getting out in the communities, uh, having conversations about these policy issues with people at their doorstep um, and really reminding lawmakers that now isn't the time to rest on our laurels. Uh, it's time to double down on advancing freedom and opportunity because that's how we can ensure that West Virginia prospers and arguably our state's never been in a better position to do just that. It's really uh, putting that in context when you say since the prohibition era, a day one of a new administration with a Republican governor, a Republican House, and a Republican Senate should Patrick Morrissey win, and many people expect that he would. And if you saw uh, Hoppy's written commentary today, the money certainly indicates that there's a significant advantage for Morrissey, a million cash on hand to Steve Williams was 50,000. That's a 20 times monetary advantage right there just in cash on hand, and the fundraising is even uh, more in Morrissey's favor when it comes to that. Uh, so let's talk about some of your agenda items here. Expand education freedom, fix health care, lower taxes and spending, and regulatory reform. Let's begin first with expand education freedom, which I think we could safely argue has already, uh, it's a process that's already begun. What else would you like to see it uh, expanded to? Well, sure. I think, you know, with the, with the enactment of the Hope Scholarship Program, which was the nation's first universal education savings account, um, we kind of kicked the door open for a lot of states to go down this pathway. Uh, really, there's been over, um, you know, I think 12 states at this point that have enacted legislation that is extremely similar to what West Virginia pioneered in that regard. So we've already been a leader as a state on the national stage in terms of innovation within education. Um, we need to go even further. We need to continue to have the broadest education freedom laws in the nation. But you know, we also have to take a hard look at our public school system, because right now we have a top-down sort of bureaucratic education system that really, uh, in the estimation of, of a lot of research, has tied the hands of teachers in our public schools, and in some cases, Rob, has ushered in curriculum that parents just simply don't agree with. So we need to essentially reverse course. We need to, for lack of a better term, deregulate our public schools so that Teachers are able to do what teachers do, and that's teach and individualize education around the unique needs of each student. I mean, listen, our, our kids are more than test scores, and there are, you know, kids are individuals. They've got dreams. They've got aspirations. Every kid is different. Ask any parent. They know that. And we need an education system that is, is better suited to customizing education around each kid. So yep. that's that's a major priority for us when it comes to education. I want to get through all four of these. So if you give me your quick bullet points, and Bill and Marie are taking notes, and they'll come back, and they're going to fill in some questions on each of these. But I want to make sure you get through all four of these first. Fix health care. That's a big one. Absolutely. 
We know it's too expensive. We know it's too complicated. Um, one of the major steps that a state can take uh, to truly open up access, make health care more affordable, accessible for folks, is to repeal certificate of need. Um, the Department of Justice, under both Republican and Democrat administrations, has said that certificate of need uh, is a failed experiment that was set up by the federal government uh, and forced upon states. Many states have repealed their certificate of need uh, laws. Because what Certificate of Need does, Rob, and we've talked about this before, it allows uh, unelected bureaucrats to decide whether your community gets a new medical service or an expanded medical service. That's not right. Um, Some of these folks have a vested interest in existing market competition. They don't want to see competition come in. Um, It's not necessarily uh, that we're trying to advance uh, a free market approach to health care. Instead, it's a localized uh, version of healthcare in which, uh, you know, providers know their communities, they know what folks need in those communities. So let's let them provide that by repealing certificate of need. Lower taxes and spending. There's been a state income tax already enacted, and the governor is proposing up to an eight or nine uh, additional reduction in state income taxes on top of that. What do you have for me there, Jason? Well, I mean, Common sense and the majority research tells us that when you lower taxes, uh, it allows people to invest in their version of the American dream to be able to afford what they want to invest in in their lives. Um, you know, it, like you said, lawmakers have, have taken big strides toward reducing the personal income tax, which is uh, you know a, a huge barrier, I think, to people being able to, to frankly afford their version of the American dream. Uh, we got to go further. We need to we need to eliminate the personal income tax altogether. Um, and we need to do it in a fiscally responsible fashion. So what we're asking lawmakers to do is uh, continue to rein in spending, uh, continue to reduce taxes. Um, there are priorities that we have uh, as, as government operates that we need to focus in on, um, and that means that government has to live within its means in order to be able to spend on those priorities. Regulatory reform. Sure. I mean, you know, listen, uh, as we continue to fight back against President Biden's uh, federal overreach, uh, unelected state bureaucrats here are are threatening our way of life in terms of what uh, barriers are put in the way of entrepreneurs and and businesses to be able to create economic opportunity and prosperity in the state. Uh, We've got to cut through that red tape. We've got to do it boldly but thoughtfully. And so we're asking lawmakers to take a hard look at all of the, the regs and rules that exist in the state, uh, make sure that they're actually doing what they're supposed to do, which is uh, protect public health as opposed to create market barriers to entry. And a reminder, because this would be a new administration, the 60-day session this upcoming year, 25, wouldn't start until February. I think they go in for a day or two in January, but meaningful work won't begin until February. Bill? Yeah, good morning, Jason. Uh, man, you've given enough stuff that we can spend the next three days talking about. So uh, uh, going to regulatory reform, uh, there's been a lot, there's been a push recently for some cultural issues to become regulated and uh, uh, imposing requirements on various cultural issues. We're thinking about the library, uh, transgender, uh, and uh, abortion and the like. Uh, what is your position on these? Should we, uh, should we kind of stu- uh, direct our regulations toward other areas, or these are these ones that I mentioned fair game? Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to get out from under your question, but I, I don't really know what you're asking, Bill. Okay, specifically, uh, uh, this last session we were going to regulate what could be, uh, what library books could be uh, made available. Uh, transgender issues, we have been, a lot of talk has been what can and cannot be done uh, with transgender kids. Uh, these are, in my view, new regulations. Uh, are you considering those to be something that you need to include under regulatory reform? Well, I think that what you're what you're discussing more so falls into the the conversation around education in the state, and I think particular to public school libraries, things of that nature, um, the curriculum that that occurs in public schools that the kids receive. Uh, obviously, the state has a vested interest with regards to making curriculum decisions um, because you know taxpayers are footing the bill for public education, right? Um, I think more so what we want to focus on when it comes to how education is delivered. 
Um, again, we want to get it away from being this sort of top-down thing that the, the powers that be in Charleston say, this is what the kids are going to learn. No, we want parents to be in the driver's seat when it comes to the education, access to the education that is best suited to their child's unique needs. And we've done that um, in several instances. You know, again, the Hope Scholarship is a great example where you can totally customize your child's education to be what you want it to be, um, to meet the aspirations and and dreams of your student. But we've also uh, enacted one of the strongest open enrollment laws in in the nation in that, uh, you know, kids in public school can attend any public school they want to. Um, So we've essentially gotten rid of residential assignment and limiting people to uh, you know, attend a public school based on their zip code, which was nonsensical to begin with. So we have we have increased the agency that parents have when it comes to education, and, and by my estimation, um, you know, we've empowered them to to deal with those kinds of issues very well. So, Jason, um, so you believe that expanding educational freedom will um, will strengthen the public schools as well? Is that correct? Well, all the data that we have in terms of the impact on public schools when you allow for additional educational pathways is that even public school test scores go up. Uh, and that's because, you know, you you're have a situation where kids are able to find the education pathway that's right for them. Uh, it's less, you know, for kids that the traditional public school system doesn't, doesn't pan out for, um, they're empowered to go and find an option that, that works for them. Uh, you know, whatever the whatever the use case may be. And so, yeah, I think I think the data bears out that we will make our education system a, a more rising tide that lifts all ships um, by expanding educational freedom. But but like I said, we've got to take a hard look at how we um, deliver education in the public school setting. And I think that there are a lot of sort of bureaucratic red red tape uh, hoops that teachers are having to jump through. I mean, we should not be teaching to a test. Uh, We've got to find a way to individualize education in the public school setting so that teachers can do what they do best, and that's teach. And then under the lower taxes and spending bullet, if you will, to eliminate the personal income tax, um, you talked some about priorities. Then what are the priorities um, on the spending side of the equation, are there any in particular um, that you're looking at? Sure. I mean, I think when I like when I, when I think about this, um, the, the government has a couple of spending priorities that are constitutionally mandated things we've got to do. Um, things like education, roads, social services for the truly vulnerable. Um, when we're talking about reining in spending and returning as many tax dollars as possible to people so that they can afford their version of the American dream, we are doing that so that we can grow the economy. If we want to have more resources to be able to have a more robust social safety net for the truly vulnerable, you've got to have economic growth. You can't do it without economic growth. So for the, you know, um, the, the crowd out there that, that would rather tax us all 100% and give us back you know, whatever meager amount that they thought we should get and, and put the rest toward government spending. Um, in the words of Margaret Thatcher, uh, the problem with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. And so what we're talking about is a system of uh, essentially lower taxes, uh, lower spending, but spending on priorities that are genuine spending priorities constitutionally mandated ones. We've got to grow the economy so that we can have that more robust social safety net. But isn't the priorities in the eyes of the beholder? What's in the eye of your priority is different from the other guy's priority? Well, certainly, and I think that's uh, that's obviously part of the, the legislative process of budgeting. Um, but, you know, again, there's things that are constitutionally mandated, and then there's things that um, government engages in that perhaps it shouldn't. And so, when we think about how, on a practical scale, uh, government in this state operates, I think it's it's prudent and important for lawmakers to really kind of reimagine um, how our government is operating and and really kind of uh, take take a different approach in terms of size and scope. Yeah, you mentioned the health care certificate of need. Uh, this subject has uh, been been banded around a great deal uh, in this area for the last two or three years. Uh, 
and the and significant need covers obviously the hospitals, but organizations such as hospice as well. Do you see a carve out at all with, for certificate of need? You know, typically when states uh, when states do this reform, there have been several that have fully repealed their certificate of need laws, and, and rightly so. One of the uh, one of the carve outs often one of the the things on the negotiating block when the legislation is going through, if you will, is is around things like nursing homes and hospice. Um, and I think, you know, my, my opinion about that is essentially um, when you have a more captive audience of folks that, that perhaps are, are less health care consumers uh, and more um, kind of, again, a, a captive audience, it, it changes the discussion around that a little bit. So, you know, that's, that's a discussion we'll have when, uh, when lawmakers get to that particular topic and, and have a bill before them. But uh, that's, that's an interesting topic to bring up, Bill. Jason Huffman, our guest here, Americans for Prosperity. Each year they release an agenda of items that uh, they'd like to see addressed. Can you tell us your track record of success or failure in regards to these agenda items as the years have gone by, Jason? Um, well, you know, I think that I like to think that we've been pretty successful. I mean, you know, you've, you've had uh, the first universal school choice bill in the nation happen in West Virginia. Uh, we've had the largest tax cut in state history occur. Um, things like the repeal of prevailing wage and uh, right to work being enacted. Uh, we think that we've got a pretty good track record, and we are excited. Uh, again, I've been doing this for, for over a decade at this point, and I've never been more excited about the position West Virginia is in to enact transformational reforms really rapidly. So um, we're excited. Uh, we think that we've we've got a good glide path coming up for uh, making the state a better place to live, work, and raise a family. Jason, uh, going back to the rubric of education, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, cutting down, removing some of the barriers, uh, geographic barriers where a student could go. But the quality of education, the quality of our instruction, uh, that's received a lot of uh, uh, a lot of criticism, also a lot of defense for it. What would you do specifically to improve the uh, uh, what the instruction in the classroom itself? Well, I think that uh, there needs to be a lot more local autonomy in terms of, uh, when I say local, I mean teachers right now have to face a, a bunch of regulatory hurdles. Um, they have to plan their lesson planning around um, teaching to a test, around the sort of top-down mandates from Charleston. We, we want education to be a lot more community-driven, a lot more of a dialogue between parents and families and, and their local school um, about the, the ability for teachers to individualize education. And so I think we've got to take a lot of the, the sort of top-down mandates off the table. Uh, and I think a, a good way to think about this, if you look at how charter schools, for instance, operate, um, they have a lot of autonomy in terms of their lesson playing, in terms of their curriculum, um, but they also have a lot of accountability um, in terms of uh, what what they're expected to do from from a you know metrics perspective, uh, I, I think that we could adopt a lot of that thought process when it comes to public schools um, by again increasing that autonomy at, at, at the, the teacher level, removing a lot of the regulatory burden that they they have to deal with that frankly just gets in the way of them them being able to educate kids. Um, and also, you know, we, we need to take a hard look at our funding formula in the state. The way that we fund education is wildly complicated. I mean, you have obviously state dollars that flow into it. There's, there's federal dollars that flow in and local dollars. Um, but if you go into the code section where we fund education, it's voluminous, complicated. Um, I, I think it needs to be much more centered around the student and around uh, enrollment because um, ideally, we would have a, a, a per pupil spending formula uh, strictly so that the money follows the kid. So, Jason, do you think it's realistic to, to think that you can reform the school aid formula? Because you've just made reference to that, and it is ridiculously complicated um, how it all works. But um, is the legislature um, primed to do that at this point in time? 
Well, certainly, what we're what we're endeavoring to do with with our pathway to prosperity is is to build that issue salience, to build momentum around these issues, to have the discussion with. Again, you know, we've we've got folks and our activists and staff out knocking doors every day, talking to folks in their communities about these issues, um, because we want to increase the awareness around what what is possible when it comes to the reforms we're looking at. Um, I'm not saying that any of the things on this list are necessarily a, a light lift, um, but, you know, I think that West Virginians have been pretty clear in terms of how they voted. Um, they are tired of politicians that want to merely tinker around the margins. West Virginians want bold, transformational policy, um, the lawmakers that have been on board with providing that have largely seen electoral success. The ones that have kind of been status quo, uh, mired in, well, we've always done it this way, they don't typically succeed very well when it comes to time for election. So uh, I think the incentive is certainly there for lawmakers to, to take a look at some of these heavier lift policies and say, hey, we have a real opportunity in this state uh, to be to be leaders on the national scale uh, when it comes to having, you know, for lack of a better term, a gold standard for governance as a state. And so we're we're asking lawmakers and policymakers to think big um, and to take bold action. I got a text from the vice chair of finance, Delegate John Hardy, in regards to certificate of need. Just to go back a moment, uh, last session, the House Health Committee passed a full repeal of certificate of need with a carve out for hospice but they could not get the votes on the floor, or at least that's what we were told. That's from Delegate uh, John Hardy here. Uh, we've got about two minutes left. Bill, did you have a question? Yeah, I was going to say, how active do you anticipate you'll be in the governor's race come fall? Well, um, we were extremely active during the primary because it was an extremely competitive race. Uh, and we were very happy to support uh, Patrick Morrissey in that, in that electoral victory. Um, again, Bill, I think that, um, you know, the general election – not very competitive. I think that Patrick Morrissey is, is well positioned to to be our next governor. Uh, just given the political landscape, we're still extremely supportive of him. Um, and so I think right now our thought process is let's focus on policy. Uh, let's start building the groundwork there. And uh, I think we're we're extremely well suited toward having a conversation at the door with with voters. Good. Uh, Jason, the final uh, thoughts are yours. How to Folks, find out more about Americans for Prosperity and get in touch with you. Yeah, sure. I think, uh, again, you know, if you want to check out uh, the Pro Pathway to Prosperity legislative agenda, it's wvpathway.com. And, uh, you know, we'll look forward to, to seeing folks at their doorsteps all across the state this summer. Did you folks release your legislative scorecard for the last session, or do you do that every two years? No, we, uh, we released it. We released it. Uh, and just to be candid, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, stuff on it this year. I mean, the, the legislative session was not as active as it has been in the past. I think we, we all suffered through that in the first month <laughs> trying to do a show here, by the way. Uh, and, and could you resend that scorecard to me? I don't recall receiving it. Yes, sir. I will do that. Yeah, maybe you got caught up in Bill's spam folder or something. I don't know. <laughs> hey, thanks, man. Always good to talk to you. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Hey, thanks. thanks for having us on.